Hi, everybody. It's so wonderful to see you today. Um, and I just want to welcome you to this very special conversation I'm having with Jamie Angus, uh, who's joining me here uh, from her home in Salford, I believe. No, in York. I'm here in York. in York. Okay. So in I, mean, York. I have to be near the hospital at the moment, Leslie. So I'm actually staying in York at the moment. Okay. Well, I'm just, you know, we are honored to have you. And we love you, and we're glad that you can spend some time with us and telling us your story. Um, so I will just uh, get into it. And of course, this is just a, a recording. I'm sure people, if they want to have questions, they can uh, direct it to us at soundgirls at soundgirls.org, and we'll try to answer your questions, okay? Thanks, everybody. So um, I think where I want to start is 2006 in Paris. Okay. Because that's when I met you, and I, that was, I think, my second semester teaching at University of Colorado Denver, and I had to teach um, surround sound, and right. Super Audio CD was there, uh, was sort of growing in popularity. It's since declined in popularity, but there's this special way of recording where you could use one bit, and it wasn't linear PCM where it's 16 bits or 24 bits or even 32 floating point, it was just one bit. And the the magic behind that uh, was elusive. I didn't understand it. So I you know, looked in the trade journals and the textbooks and this person named Jamie Angus's name was in there. I said, I wonder if I can talk to Jamie. And so at the 2006 AES convention, I saw you were giving a talk. I think it was on noise um noise shaping it would have been yeah. something like that it would have been something related to super audio cd around that time so yes i i'm guessing it would have been some technical aspect of that um but hey, well, we would have been i would have certainly been talking about it and that's when i found you i, I found your the room where you were given the lecture and i sat and listened and you were teaching at that time and you were teaching us so it wasn't you know what i seem to remember at that time was it wasn't a lot of calculus and jargon you were really wanting the people in the audience to understand how this worked and i really appreciated that about you that's it's your style you always are are teaching um, so do you want to uh, share your recollections of 2006 in Paris? Oh, yeah, 2006. Well, I, I have to say, I don't remember meeting you at the, t the talk I gave. Um, um, but I do remember, what I do remember is we ended up meeting again in the evening. Uh, that was when the AES conventions used to have dinners. And we were in Paris um, and they'd organized a boat trip on the Seine with a meal. So I I remember you know we showed up you know, I guess for the the pre meet dinner drinks and you were there so I came over and said hi or maybe you came over and said hi to me and Teresa Leonard was there um, uh, I don't know if she was president at the time or whether she'd just been president or was president elect um, but um, we ended up chatting together and I, know, I remember the three of us ending up sharing a table um, on the boat and having. What I remember as being a rather nice French meal as we cruised up and down the Seine with the Eiffel Tower in lights and everything else. Um, <laughs> it was almost a date. Um, <laughs> that was great. I mean, <laughs> the, definitely a, a cherished memory of mine. And um, from there, we just kept in touch. And that's, you know, that's one thing that sound girls should know um, is that that those chance encounters, that networking, you know, the fact that it was curiosity that brought us together. Yes. You know, it wasn't just networking for the, the sake curi of it. Curiosity and um, Ambisonics was another, which we'll, you're going to come to a bit later in the interview anyway, when we talk about some of the earlier stuff that I've done. And uh, we knew both knew a common person in York called Dave Malham. Um, as well, because I'd worked at York University for a while, so I knew Dave, Dave Malham quite well. Yeah, so we did keep in touch, and uh, in fact, when you came over for a Fulbright, was it a Fulbright you came yeah, over yeah. for? When you came over for, for a Fulbright, and 
was spent it at York, we ended up meeting again. And uh, that's a whole different story that um, will uh, probably outside the scope of this, but you introduced me to some of your other colleagues who weren't in audio. Yes, um, Melinda De Jesus was yes, a, a yeah. colleague, not audio, but definitely feminist scholar. Yes, uh, yes feminist scholars. And uh, that was my introduction. I went to my first ever feminist conference, which was brilliant. Uh, so yes, so we kept in touch. That that magic of networking um, is somebody, something that I want everybody to keep in mind because it's the networking, it's the role models, it's the mentoring, you know, that, that perfect trifecta that allows us to, as women especially, you know, um, advance, uh, succeed, um, not get discouraged. Uh, but um, I think speaking about paths, uh, maybe we can rewind this. So I started at 2006 because that's when our paths crossed. But you know, yeah. your audio journey actually started much, much earlier. Yes. And um, I don't know how far back you want to go, but at some point we definitely have to hear about the loudspeakers you built. Um, okay. Um, how, which, which, which one of the loudspeakers I built? Um, <laughs> uh, okay. I seem to remember you, you sold a pair. Oh, the ones I sold. Okay. <laughs> So, well, let's let's go right way back into time. Um, apparently, according to my parents, I was always interested in making things or doing things. So apparently I used to combine wire coat hangers, um, old, you know, used cotton reels and string to make pulleys and use them to open doors and things. I don't remember this. This is apparently what I did when I was a toddler. Um, so uh, I was obviously interested in science from a very, very early time um, and uh, fascinated by how things worked. I did tend to try to take things to bits. Um, I once took my alarm clock to bits. That was not a good thing to do. Um, um, so, yes, um, I was not from a wealthy background. My father had me as a student. He was a medical student and uh, it was the 50s. So my parents had to get married. Um, he then managed to produce another three children with my mother. So that's four children, a student doctor. Um, so uh, and we were in early 60s Britain, which was still uh, people don't remember this, but rationing sweet rationing finished the year before i was born and really britain through the late 50s early 60s you know was still a very poor country struggling to put itself back on its feet economically after the devastation of the first second world war um so very plain food not a lot of food enough um but uh I do remember being hungry a lot of the time. Um, and uh, my father was very ambitious and we ended up moving around a lot. So I went to three different primary schools and then he did um, a very interesting thing. He, at the time, if you wanted to be a consultant um, top doctor in the UK, you had to do something called your BTA. That's what they called it, which has been to America. Because in the 60s, America was where all the, the hip new medicine stuff was happening. And he was interested in psychiatry. So he took a post in Rockland County, Orange County, Rockland County Hospital, hospital in Orange County in Rockland, um, and um, in Bergen Pines, which is near Bell Labs. And we moved to America. 1965, age nine, I moved to America by boat um which is really interesting so i have actually done the traditional route into new york harbor um past the statue of liberty past ellis island we didn't have to stop off at ellis island um we um did all that stuff in in liverpool and arrived at new york dock on july the 6th two days after the independence day on a blazing hot and humid New York summer's day, I walked down the cool, I went, walked off the coolness of the boat into what seemed to me an oven. Um, was startled when 
uh, the very large customs officer seemed unduly interested in my violin. Um, was said, what's in the violin case? And I thought, oh, strange man. Um, I knew nothing about the history of America and the prohibition at that point. So I didn't realize that violin cases had a bad, <laughs> bad vibes. Um, and I had a violin because I used to play, I played violin. And I was starting to learn violin in the UK. And in fact, in the um, USA, I played in the elementary school orchestra that I went to. Um, I also sang and things like that. In fact, I had a lovely soprano voice then um, and was was shortlisted for the being a mall in the mall and the night visitors for a production. I don't know where the production was, but I know it was up in competition with one other person and I didn't get it because I didn't have the stagecraft, but I sang the songs better, apparently. Um, so interest in music from a very early age um, and interested in science, um, which was a little bit considered a little bit odd, a little bit of a fish out of water because I was English and um, people in Nyack, um, the kids in Nyack were uh, not sure about these English people. Um, so uh, there was a few bits of awkwardness about that. Um, I also didn't know anything about the other cultural things. And it was a very turbulent time um, in American civil rights and history. I mean, the, the Pettus, um, uh, oh, oh, what was it called? There was a film about it with the Pettus Bridge March. Um, oh, no. Yeah. But that incident happened only three months before I arrived. So I literally, mm -hmm. as an innocent English person, ended up in the middle of all this. Um, and um, that was a bit of an eye opener. Uh, we didn't have a lot of money. Um, I discovered junkyards. America had junkyards. Junkyards had old televisions. Old televisions had loudspeakers in them. And actually, surprisingly enough, one of the few things that you could get out of an old television or a radio was the loudspeaker. So I did start playing around with um, wiring up loudspeakers um, and um, seeing if I could be make a better noise from them um, from than what my parents' um, record player could do. Uh, and... February 1968, there's a, there's a little video which I'll get Sandgirls to drop a link to. Um, I picked up this magazine called Popular Electronics, and it said, time a speeding bullet. And I thought, wow, that's impressive. Bullets are really fast. And I ended up buying that magazine, and it's one of those classic you read a young adult novels where somebody buys a magazine, opens it, and they don't understand anything in it. And I opened this this magazine, and it it had these terms like FET mixer and SWR and and funny squiggly diagrams and like what are these things? <laughs> um, at Ham, there was a really good library in Nyack, and I went there, and they had. One shelf had Morgan's Books of Electronics for boys. Um, and I started at book number one and I worked all the way. I think they went up to about book number 10, something like that. But I did work through them um, and uh, it was pretty cool. I actually quite, you know, I found it quite exciting, this electronics thing. It did, did, it did seem to... Uh, um, you know, it, it hit a, quite a few spots in me for what made it things interesting because I quite liked the idea of circuits and electricity. And then in grade six, um, we did a visit. Uh, we, I mean, we were near New York and I'd already done astronomy courses in the Hyden Planetarium and things like that. Um, but we did a school visit to WOR Studios, which was a big television radio studios in New York at the time. And, uh, oh, that was in heaven. 
it was amazing because uh, there was all this gear, you know, big quadruplex videotape recorders and other tech, you know, audio tape recorders and racks of equipment. And, you know, my eyes were out like organ stops. And one of the engineers could see that I was, you know, really entranced by all this. And I can't remember. I think the kids were having Kool-Aid and biscuits. But he said, would you like to have a look around the transmitter racks and some of the other bits? And I said, sure. So he took me around and we went around the back and we looked, we saw the glowing tubes of the transmitters and everything else. And it was, uh, wow. Um, and we had an interview. I was, I was one of the kids selected to be interviewed for the evening radio program. And the lady said, what do you want to be when you grow up, honey? And I said, I want to be a radio engineer. So I was 11. Wow. So yeah. 11. I said, I want to be a radio engineer. And I remember 2000, it was actually 2007, flying into New York. Um, and maybe even earlier when I first went to an AOS convention in New York, flying into New York, thinking, you know, when I was 11, I said I wanted to be a radio engineer. OK, I'm not a radio engineer, but I'm an audio engineer. Um, yeah, really isn't, close. <laughs> and here I am flying back to the location where I actually expressed that desire all those years ago you know so that was pretty amazing so um i i started making loudspeakers and i mean you know there's a limit to what you can do with um uh um uh old tv speakers um why i got sent back to school in the uk uh for secondary school i didn't end up going to high school or junior high in the states um and uh i kept my interest in electronics going because by that time um um and this ties in with my experience as well there was this i was really interested in music i mean my other love was music and i uh all right and you might you know 60s kid you know kid born in the 50s i like rock and roll i loved old school rock and roll i like new orleans jazz liked all those things, but I really liked Baroque and Renaissance music. And my father had um, an album, one of these vinyl things, um, how we rolled in those days, with um, Renaissance dances and things played on original instruments. Now, if you ever hear original Renaissance instruments, they're quite bright and a bit blarty, you know. Um, anyway, in the 60s, late 60s, this record came out by one Wendy Carlos called Switched on Bach. And it was one of the first albums I ever bought. Um, and I remember playing it and being utterly blown away because, you know, there were the sounds I liked in Renaissance instruments being produced electronically. And at that point, I became really interested in electronic music instruments mm -hmm. and the circuits that made them work. So when I went to boarding school, I was, um, you know, there were magazine articles on build your own synthesizer. I couldn't afford any of them. I really could not. I mean, they were beyond my, you know, oh. on the sort of money I had available. I couldn't build circuits, um, you know, this is, I, I got sent to boarding school, and uh, grammar school effectively. And uh, it wasn't, it was a semi-private school. It was partially state funded, partially fees funded. So it was sort of halfway house. Um, so in that sense, it was privileged. Um, and uh, yeah, so it was mostly theoretical, but I really learned, I read lots of books. I mean, boarding school was not a good experience for you. Those are the worst five years of my life very lonely five years and I, I read a lot. I read and I read and I read and I read about how these devices worked. I managed to persuade the teachers to let me go to the main library and you know I was looking at graduate levels texts on how transistors worked and radio astronomy and all sorts of stuff. I'm pretty Catholic in my reading tastes but I was still interested in loudspeakers and then when I was 17, I left boarding school and went to Canada, went to the local university, 
University of Lethbridge. And there's some sound girls people at oh. the University of Lethbridge. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, Mary Mazarek's there now. What you have to understand was I was at a Scottish school where if you're in the higher set, you basically do A-level equivalent work in your grade 11, for want of a better term. And uh, you get it at 17. So I basically did everything I needed to do, I'd done by the age of 17. All the courses I wanted to do, because there weren't very many that did electronics, it was at the time electronics, it's hard to understand this now, but at the time, electronics was a special subject for people who were even weirder than physicists. Okay, so... <laughs> You could do electronics with physics and you could do like ele pure electronics, um, which was in those days very physics based as well. I mean, uh, uh, and, but there were only there was only one course in Scotland and all the rest were in the in England where I knew everybody would be 18. So I'd have been a year younger. I also looked like I was 12. Um, so. I knew I wouldn't be able to get into bars or anything like that. Mm. And I just spent five years basically living um, a very regimented existence where I was told what to do all the time. And I thought, I need a year, you know, to see if I can actually function, you know, where it's only me telling me what to do. So I went to the university. My parents had moved to Lethbridge by then. And I kept up my interest in making speakers and stuff like that. So the year when I was in Lethbridge, um, I then did a year at Lethbridge and I it was a liberal arts university and I took full advantage. I did philosophy, I did music because I wasn't allowed to do music at school. I did drama, I did some physics to keep my hand in, I did computer science and I did... Um, a course on essay writing um, because um, because my English teacher, that was my one subject I didn't have a hire in, and she said, you need to get your writing skills up. And she just said, do any course that gets you writing. It doesn't matter what. So I did that. And that was a fun year. I really enjoyed it. And during that year, I used the physics facilities to actually measure some loudspeakers that I'd bought because <clears throat> I did have a job and I was able to save some money, uh, save enough money, in fact, to buy a hi-fi system, but not the speakers. So I <clears throat> I measured a loudspeaker and designed some loudspeaker enclosures for them. And I actually had four. I built four loudspeakers. <clears throat> and uh, they sounded pretty good. They were big. Uh, they were huge, actually. <laughs> they were like... 32 inches high or something like that and 18 inches wide and 15 inches deep and I had a tiny bedroom but I had a four speaker quadraphonic system sitting in my bedroom um, in 1973 um, for those of it who are interested in it was a Dynaudio um, Dyna Hafler system so you didn't you only needed a stereo amplifier but actually it did pretty good I mean on live material you got a real sense of ambience from it. Um, and all you needed was an extra pair of loudspeakers. I've still got my Dynaco adapter somewhere up in, in, a, in a cupboard. Um, cool. And, uh, but after a year, I was, uh, um, uh, <clears throat> you know, and my friends came in and heard the speakers and they were all very impressed. And these were unfinished. So literally chipboard, with speakers in, nothing fancy, nothing frilly. And I realized I was not going to be able to take them to back to the UK with me because <laughs> um, just not going to happen. So I thought, well, I better get rid of them. Um, so I just said to one of the people I know, I said, I said, I'm gonna have to sell my speakers. He said, oh, well, I'll buy a pair. I said, really? <laughs> he said, yeah, I'll buy a pair. I said, uh, okay. Um, he said, what do you want for them? I said, what would you pay for them? So he said, I pay 400 bucks for them. I said, really? Okay. 
if you want if you want to pay 400 bucks a pair of speakers is yours and he thought he was he was dead happy he, and that was 1973 man. 1973 400 bucks and then another friend that was two speakers got another friend said oh i'll buy the other pair he said how much do you want for them so i said 400 bucks he said done and i delivered them one day uh i actually uh, collected the money one day that's it um i remember i had 800 dollars in notes in cash that's amazing in 1973 in my back pocket now to put that into context uh i had bought an the bottom end of the nakamishi cassette recorder range and people that remember back in the 70s nakamishi was the brand it was the best cassette recorder you could get at the time 700 800 dollars would have bought got me into the nakamishi three head cassette recorder category i could have spent the money doing that i didn't as it happens but um but it was more money than I'd ever had in my life. And I was terrified. So I had to cross town thinking, I'm going to be jumped on. I'm going to be robbed until I got to the credit union and put it in, the, in my account. But that was my first ever sale of audio equipment was these speakers. Um, and they, the, the customers were really happy with them. You know, I can see faults in them now. But very interesting. The first speakers I'd really tried to design, I still... You know, at the time, it was pre-teal and small. Um, so, you know, people were still feeling away on how to design reflex geezers. But, but you know, they made a nice sound. And, uh, you know, for people that like rock and things, they were they were good speakers. Um, and then back to university in the UK um, with a, um, a, a cassette recorder, cassette replay facility um and 1973 yes so i 1974 i started studying ele electronics at the university of Kent canterbury and again just to put this into context the microprocessor had just started to be rolled out the 8080 came out in 1973 if i remember correctly the 6800 came out in 1974, 6502 at the end of 1974. 8-bit microprocessors, very basic things. Just the beginning of the microprocessor VLSI revolution. Optical fibers were being developed, but hadn't been rolled out into practical application. So... The electronics course I did, well, I, I say it was the social life of the electron. We studied the electron alone, the electron with other electrons, the electron moving through crystals, the electrons in tubes. I mean, we had an entire course on electrons in tubes, you know, how tubes worked, how valves, valves in the UK worked, um, but also how mass, mass spectrometers worked and... Uh, electron microscope lenses, all sorts of things. And all of the courses were geared up. At the time, the preserved future for telecoms was long-range microwave communication in what looked like sewer pipes. Basically, they, they had this whole idea. They're going to use 30 gigahertz or 90 gigahertz down something that was about the size of a sewer pipe. So we were, and at the time, that was really pushing the technology as well. So we were learning all these weird and wonderful devices, double trap at diodes and all sorts of strange things. Um, but no, no computers, nothing in computing at all. And I got quite heavily involved in the radio station um, uh, while I was at Kent. So I DJed things, I technically operated, I was part of the engineering team. And in fact, my final year project was to do an AM stereo <coughs> modulation system. Because wow, I thought, what year was that? That would have been 1977. Wow, okay. And I, I, I mean, and I designed a full box. It all worked. You basically plugged the oscillator in, you know, the RF went in, in one port, left and right went in the other. And what came out was um, RF to go to the PA, which gave you 
uh, what was known as compatible sine band um, amplitude modulation. And so the left channel was on one side band, the right channel was on the other. So if you had two radios, you could tune one to one, one, one to, to left and one to right, and you could get a stereo effect. And it had a compressor in it. Wow. Um, had a two to one compressor in it. I've still got it. I, I, I know where it is. I've still got the box. Um, but AM stereo didn't take off. I mean, wasn't available ever. I mean, when did AM stereo? Uh, I think it's it was sort of semi took off. The the RCA quad compatible QAM system ended up being chosen. I ended up going for the this thing called the Khan system. Um, because I'd read about it. I mean, at the time, I'd only read about Khan's compatible single sideband system, and I just thought I could design a stereo system with that. And then I discovered he'd proposed a stereo system with it. It was they were still discussing it in seventy six. Well, when I was doing it, it would have been seventy six. Um, I I think there are stations or there were stations out there that did broadcast it because in the states, especially in the Midwest, FM doesn't really have the range you need okay to cover um but uh yes but i i designed a complete working system that i learned a very hard lesson though with that because i did all this circuit design and it was all excellent circuit design i did a really terrible write-up so i mean i did get a good mark for it um but not in comparison to my other marks i got borderline first class honors to one mark um so, I mean, I, I don't know what that would translate to in American parlance, but, uh, uh, you know, some of, my exam, <laughs> some, some of my exam results were much, much higher than that. I did really well at university. While I was doing that, um, of course, um, my uh, supervisor suggested I might want to think about doing a PhD. So he'd... Uh, I went up to Cambridge and got interviewed there and they were doing something called finite field transforms. And I thought, whoa, that's cool. Um, and came back. I didn't, they did give me the forms to fill in, but I didn't end up applying to Cambridge. Mm -hmm. And one of my friends built a digital filter. <clears throat> and again, you've got to remember these days, these days we didn't have, DSP and stuff like that. This was, you know, digital filters were you read about in research papers and maybe the military used them. Um, but Dave built a digital filter and it was amazing because analog went in. So he had the A to D converter. Then he did a filter and it was a very simple filter. It was just a low pass filter. Uh, and then he had a D to A converter to produce the output. And I remember the, the day he got it working, he said, I got it working. You know, there's about 10 of us or 11 of us in the lab. We all rushed over and had a look, you know, and there it was, you know, signal going in, this board of hardware and, you know, somewhat rough sample signal coming out. You know, wow. he swept the sine wave oscillator up and we could see, you know, constant level going in and the output fading off into zero as, he, you know, you went up in frequency. You know, I thought, wow, that's really cool. So I thought digital signal processing, that's kind of an interesting thing. That would be kind of cool as well. And of course, by the end of my course, I was aware that there was this thing called the microprocessor that I'd done absolutely nothing uh, about in my course. And my way of learning things is generally to jump into the middle and just splash around. So I thought, you know, I ought to learn about this computer stuff because it looks like it might become important. You know, it hadn't, hadn't really taken off, but you could see people were starting to get excited. So I thought, hmm, if I end up doing a PhD, why don't I design a computer? Because I'd have to learn about these how a computer works. If I had to design one, I'd learn how it worked. So... um. I decided if I was going to do a PhD, I'd design a, a computer. It would be a signal processing computer, and it would be able to do finite field arithmetic, so it could do these finite field transforms. And they let me do it. I cannot <laughs> believe it. They let me do it. 
I mean, I've supervised PhDs now. I wouldn't have let me do it, for <laughs> sure. Um, I remember, I, 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 you know, the day after the results came out, I went into the meeting for potential PhD students, and Prof. Jennison said, Jamie, what do you want to do? And he just waved around to all his colleagues, and he said, they all want you. You know, and I'd had various people come and pitch their projects to me, and I said, you know, actually, what I want to do is design a digital signal processing computer. Um, and I found someone who was willing to supervise me. That was also an interesting lesson because when I started, those things were a rack full of equipment. Three years later, you could buy one for 150 pounds in a multi legged chip. That was how fast the technology moved. In mm. the late 70s, you know, we went from 8-bit microprocessors to 16-bit microprocessors, 4K of memory to 64K of memory. You know, it went boom. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, that was that was kind of scary at the time, being a PhD student. Um, but I managed it. Um, I... Uh, <laughs> It was a bit of a struggle and it took me three years to write up. The one thing I'm, I'm, this is very important to say, remember, I didn't come from a wealthy background. At the time, the UK had this system where they gave a couple of grants to each department, um, science department in the UK to fund PhD students. And they paid your university fees. They also paid living expenses. Um also threw in some a week's worth of management training as well, which was kind of useful. Um, that if I had not had that opportunity, and I got one of those awards, if I hadn't had one of those awards, there's no way I would be where I am now. That was absolutely essential. They yeah. don't exist now. And one of the things that really grieves me um, is I see students just like me who can't do what I did. They don't get the chance. Um, because those opportunities have gone. Mm. Uh, and that's kind of tough to see. Given how fast things moved, you have a number of patents. When was your first one? Oh, uh, well, that actually comes next. So uh -huh. okay. after um, my doing my PhD research, I had to get a job. So I did apply to British Telecom Research and other people. And there was this company called Standard Telecommunication Laboratories, most people have never heard of them, and they don't exist now. But essentially, they were the other Bell Labs. Um, mm -hmm. They were run by ITT, which was a competitor to AT&T, and they were based in the UK. Uh, and although you haven't heard of them, you will know of what they did, because the two major inventions that came out of those laboratories, there were other ones, were PCM, which we're using now to do this video and audio, and mm -hmm. optical fibers, which we are almost certainly using to um, do the communication between our two locations. Yeah. Um, so um, I never realized quite how high powered it was, but I ended up getting a job with them. Uh, and I was going to work on digital radio, but they then, for various reasons, I ended up working on integrated optics for a year, um, which I didn't like, um, but I could do. Their argument was she can do research. She's got a PhD. She can do research. It doesn't matter what on. Um, and I did it, but I then moved into the speech group and the um, Terra Mills and Telecoms group where I worked on speech synthesis recognition and coding and my first ever patent is actually on uh, a speech codec um ah. which uh i'd been looking at and thinking um my boss had done some work on it um and i was looking at it and thinking i could do better and came up with an idea tried it out actually um after work pitched it at him and he said well that's a really great idea we we then but we discovered, again, a very interesting lesson. We discovered that we were too late for the party. Um, 
because they'd already started standardizing on making use of this in the telephone network. And hmm. we were about six months late for the standardization. We hmm. jumped in about six months earlier. The my code probably would have gone into the mix and um I think would have ended up being the codec they used. Um, but as a result of my work, we got a seat at the standardization table. And that was interesting because, believe it or not, the real problem. So that taught me something. You know, it, standards can be everything. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter how good your idea is. You know, my idea was better than the other ideas that were around there. They had lots of advantages, but it was too late for the party. Oh. Uh, and you have to go to with a standard. But believe it or not, the signal that caused the most trouble and it was modems because there was a guarantee, there was a spec that guaranteed a certain type of modem would work over any telephone connection. And therefore, if that telephone connection had that speech coder in it, the modem had to work there. And it took ages to actually work out how to make it work for modem signals. Nothing to do with speech at all. Um, and it's so much fun. Anyway, so I... So I an example of like how what was the first place where you saw your speech codec implemented well none of my speech codecs were implemented because they oh. didn't they didn't match the standards so they okay. were so they i mean that was one of the reasons i left standard telecoms while i was there it moved from being an engineering-led organization to being a management-led organization which was kind of sad um and after a while, after about three years there, I thought, you know, I actually want to make things that people use. And I'm sitting here in an industrial research lab. And actually, you know, I'm doing all this work, but nothing's going out. It's just stopping and being forgotten. And it was at that point I moved to the University of York. And then within about six months of being at the University of York, I actually built a piece of instrumentation for the local print works to tension their paper up. Um, and uh, it had one requirement. I remember somebody coming in to our coffee room and saying, does anyone know how to do this without using a microprocessor? That's how much things had changed in the wow. three years. And, you know, because I'd read so many different things, I said, yeah, I do. Um, you can do it without a microprocessor. And they said, do you know how? I said, not exactly, but I know I've got Wireless World article at home. I'll bring it in tomorrow. So I brought it in and lo and behold, there was a way of doing it without using a microprocessor for various reasons. The customer did not want a microprocessor. Mm. They'd been burnt rather badly with, with a piece of microprocessor instrumentation. And within about six months, there was a piece of my kit that I designed and built, and uh, it was doing its job in a in a in a print works. Um, and the the customer was deliriously happy. Their only complaint they had a complaint was the color of the case. The, the case <laughs> was the case was what we could get from Radio Spears. It was brown and beige. It <laughs> wasn't the bluey color that the rest of their gear was in. I could always paint it, you know, yeah. um, but that, that was kind of ironic. And that, you know, so I ended up at the University of York. I was actually hired to bring up the UK's first integrated master's course where they did work in industry that counted towards the degree. And I was in conjunction with British Telecom. And that was a very successful course. And again, the students that I supervised, you know, we use video on demand. I can remember them doing the first experiments on an experimental exchange video on demand using video cassette recorders and wow. um, all sorts of things like that. Oh, paying for things over the then fledgling internet. A couple of students did actually worked on how do you do secure mm -hmm. payments over the internet. This is back in the late 80s, early 90s, you know, but basically late 80s, early 90s. Um, fascinating. Um, and while I was at York, so that was the first thing I did, about three years in in York, I also started 
in conjunction with uh, Dave Malum, who you know, um, and Richard Orton, who sadly is no longer with us, um, and one of my colleagues, Ross Kirk, we started the UK's first music technology course in 1985. And again, to put it into contact text, the Atari ST had just come out. It had a MIDI port. Um, the CD, I think, had just been released in its second iteration. It, it hadn't been around for long. So we're talking very, very early days. My colleagues thought we were utterly stupid. In fact, really were quite angry with us for even proposing such a thing. Uh, we must have done something right. Music hated it because it had engineering in it. Engineering hated it because it had music. <laughs> um, and the reason Ross and I did it was because both of us had the same experience. We would both wanted to do music, A-level and O-level at school. Both of us were not allowed to do it because we were doing sciences. And therefore, we weren't allowed to do music. And the rage, and it was rage, um, sustained us through the first year because we had to teach the entire first year's extra work. It was the only way we could get it through. I taught the first five students in my office on my the blackboard in my office because it was actually easier than trying to book a room and they fit in my office, so why not? But we were from five to 10 to 20. If we'd had the space, we could have gone to 40 the year after. It literally blew up like that, yeah. doubling every year. And um, now there's one in every neighborhood. Yes. And now people say, well, duh. Um, <laughs> and I, you know, that, um, and, uh, you know, we think about what happened in the last three years. You know, I think the whole music technology stuff and what's spawned out of it. Uh, was one of the things that kept us connected and sane. Um, you know, lots of people were doing things. And I remember my son getting his music technology A-level, which wouldn't have existed without the music technology course. Um, uh, and cycling back after he got his results, thinking, you know, I think I just got my revenge. <laughs> so that was, that was it. I remember that was, that was a good feeling that day. Beautiful. Beautiful, um, absolutely. Um, uh, I yes. think most of, you know, I think for everyone watching, uh, I, it's so important. It's so important that that happened because um, meanwhile in the States, when I started um, audio engineering, audio technology it was in 1987, you know, so this was, so this is where I enter the picture right um with my audio engineering thing so now i'm i'm sort of um sort of joining you on the timeline yeah. in a kind of kind of offset kind of way yeah. but um you also did um i mean in addition to the music technology course why do i feel like i, I seem to remember you telling a story that connected to pcm on beta tape yes okay yes Yes. Oh, that's now that's that's um, that happened earlier. Well, or about the same time. All right. You know, I when I started at York, um, I sort of tried to continue the speech recognition, speech coding thing um, because everybody was so down on um, audio. And in fact, even when I was doing my PhD, I was looking at I knew that high quality analog to digital conversion was a real issue for audio back in the late 70s. I mean, getting a 16 bit converter in the late 70s was like finding a unicorn. Um, and uh, I actually looked at using Delta Sigma modulation as a PhD student and got quite interesting. Sort of, you know, I have trouble keeping my mind focused on the thing. So, you know, while I was doing this big project, there I was spending other effort sort of saying, I wonder if we could use, you know, trying to work out how we could use this single bit delta modulation thing to do analog to digital conversion. Anyway, so there was this audio interest always bubbling along, even though I didn't get to do it for a little while at university. Music technology sort of gave me permission for that. And I remember going to my first audio conference, which was a UK one, 
and they were demonstrating ambisonics and it was amazing i mean you know they had a full full reproduction rig set up and it was wonderful i loved the ambience and things you got from it what i didn't like was the take noise because they couldn't use noise reduction and um you know it was pretty noisy um it wasn't great from that point of view and i thought what these people really need is a four channel digital tape recorder then they could record a b format uh, signal at a much higher quality yeah. and again because of my background and, and interests i knew there were things called partial signaling schemes i thought you know i bet we could make a partial signaling scheme that would work um and there were there were these adapters, Sony PCM seven oh ones, which gave you stereo onto a Betamax or um, recorder. And I thought, all I need to do is get two of those strapped together and then combine the signals. All right, need synchronizing up. In those days, you got service manuals and operations manuals gave you full circuit and board layouts, mm -hmm. so you had all the information was there for you. Um, so I pitched it and we ended up uh, teaming up with a company called Audio, Audio and Design. And uh, I started developing this four, ch four channel digital tape recorder. I actually ran into some problems. What I didn't realize was the Betamax had a funny nonlinear thing. Actually, VHS did as well. Um, and I think I know how it would. I mean, I, I did make the right decisions except for one. Um, I put the signal in with maximum you know, high frequency components. And I, I probably shouldn't have done that. I might have. But we ended up having to put it into Umatic rather than Betamax, but it still worked. Um, and it was one of the earliest four channel digital tape recorders, 1990, 1991. Um, um, that was when it hit the market. Um, unfortunately, Elisa Sadat hit the market a, very shortly after that. So... Uh, it crashed as a product, but I sold two. Uh. I sold one to British Telecoms for testing telephone booths, but the other one, and I'm was really pleased. The other one was bought by Wendy Carlos. I remember when they told me, I said, so who's the other customer? And they said, Wendy Carlos. And I just went, wow. <laughs> you know, something I've designed has now been bought by Wendy Carlos. And in fact, when I was in New York later that year, she saw me across the hall, a stairwell, uh, and she said, I need to talk to you. So we came over because the people at, back at base weren't taking her seriously. Um, she had a few little birdies and things they were, were needed to be sorted out. Just the usual teething problems you get in new device. But yes, I, I designed that. And that was another piece of kit that I designed and also was responsible for my first ever Audio Engineering Society paper because I had this idea I had to have a complete piece of work before I could even dare crossing the hallowed portals of the Audio Engineering Society. Of course, that's not true. I could have. There was other work I was doing in the years before on hand, which would have been fine to have presented at the Audio Engineering Society, but I didn't know just how accepting a organization they were. So, you know, I had this, you have this sort of elevated idea of... Yeah. Oh my goodness me, I can't possibly, you know, sully their doorways by going in with my ideas. So, yes, so I only sold two of them, but one of them was to Wendy Carlos, which That's I'm, great. you know, you know, given that she was the inspiration for me getting into synthesizers and things like that. Oh, speaking of other inspirational. Yeah, I, I have to say, I did okay. get to build a synthesizer, you know, when I was a a student, undergraduate student, I actually built, designed and built an electronic piano. And it was based on some of the published ideas, but it actually had two separate circuits, a fast decay and a slow decay. So the timbre changed across the note. You could vary the amount of tack and the longer one vary them and you could filter them separately as well. So you could sort of emulate harpsichords or piano-ish sounds and it was touch sensitive so you know that wasn't a product that was sort of um uh 
just something I built or one of. I've still got that as well. Yeah, I was going to say this. <laughs> Do I still have that? Yes, I haven't powered it up for a while. So, um, there's three uh, four. Yeah. Anyway, um, yes. Yeah, so where are we? So yes. Uh, so I was, I was going that to was see the if... digital four channel digital tape recorder. And uh, are we around spread spectrum time now? Um, yes, or... we probably are. So the, the tape recorder um, came out about uh, in the, the beginning of the 90s. And at that time, I'd read about the Schroeder diffuser things. Um, and um, that um, I remember... Of course, because I'd done the number theory stuff, I was like, yeah, I can see that working. Uh, but I could also see the problem that, you know, a two by two square of wood is pretty much as heavy as you can lift and offer up to a surface and attach without, you know, having terrible trouble. So you're going to have to repeat things. And so said, we should oh. probably just, just for people who who um, may or may not be keeping up. So we're now talking about diffuser panels like you find yes. in a studio that are meant to scatter the, the sound for acoustic effect. That yes. Yeah. So Schroeder, Schroeder sort of um, uh, proposed them and Peter D'Antonio commercialized it effectively with his RPG panels and things. And I was looking at him thinking, um, yeah, but if you put lots of them together, that's going to start looking like a multifaceted mirror it's not going to do do diffusion now I for my PhD I've been embedded in the middle of a communications laboratory where they were working on coding techniques spread spectrum systems and I thought you know spread spectrum that's where you um, take what would have been a sine wave which is a pretty non um uh and you and you spread it in frequency, and there's a re relationship between the frequency domain and diffusion. There's, there's the, the the relationship between the diffusion pattern and what happens on the surface is the same Fourier relationship you have between frequency domain and time domain. Um, so you know, and I knew that, uh, and I I think I would I'd had just had some major shoulder surgery. In fact, Ivana, poor poor Ivana's just had to have some shoulder surgery. Um, so I had about 10 weeks off work. Actually ended up being nine, 19 weeks off work. Um, or as my colleague said when I returned, 19 weeks. Um, they were not happy with me. <laughs> but I just got my first ever Mac. Um, and it had Excel on it and uh, I... Uh, I thought, you know, this should work. And I remember programming it in Excel. I had to write up complex arithmetic calculations in Excel and things because it wasn't built in at that time. It was a kind of early days. Um, and it worked. So, hey, I, I published it. Um, uh, and... Uh, the rest is there, saves history. And then, so that came up with a modulation idea, um, which you do see. But the other thing, you know, I then thought, you know, we could apply this to other things, absorption, non-absorption. So I came up with the absorption diffuser, binary absorption diffuser, which um, uh, I saw a picture in the newspaper yesterday. I said they were talking about drill music and how, and things so they just showed a picture of the two musicians and behind them so i recognize that that's <laughs> an absorption diffuser so um yeah um and so I, I ended up producing all this stuff on diffusion just because i'd made a little link between something over there and something here and you know mm -hmm. just combined a few things uh in the mix so to speak um but i kind of yeah, like so the way you you put it with um, Hedy Lamar spread uh, spread spectrum. You gave a really elegant um, description of how her work um, inspired your work on the diffusion panel. She didn't directly inspire it, but I th I always think it's really interesting. You know, um, Hedy Lamar was you know um, 
an actress and people people have treated her like a woman you know who didn't have any thoughts and things and yet behind you know the the pretty front that she put on um mm -hmm. there was a very bright and active mind and she and a, a friend developed a, a different sort of spread spectrum system um which uh, actually one of my last students did work use the sort of similar ideas mm -hmm. to do volumetric type diffusion mm -hmm. um uh, but she proposed a spread spectrum system for controlling torpedoes which again it's nice it's really i, I love it because it combines you know this is in the 40s um or 30s 40s with the war all right so what did they have well frequency pianos they had things that controlled pianos they were called player pianos so punched punched roll tape um driven by an electric motor 88 possible frequencies you know you could see it working and yes. it's it's a lovely it's almost steampunk um you, you know uh, um i you know and she had a paint on it but that's the point you know hedy lamar um who people normally think of as just an actress, wasn't just an actress. Yeah. You know, she had all these other ideas. I um, mean, you know, I think one of the really interesting things at the moment is we're starting to unpack those stories of the, the women that were not taught about that did things. You know, all the women in the early days of computing um, who, who actually built computers, who programmed computers, um, Kathleen Booth died about three months ago, we were 100 and something. Um, you know, she built physically, was one of the builders of one of the earliest electromechanical computers in the UK. Her then, then just uh, acquaintance, but then he became her husband, Booth, um, um, invented the Booth's, Booth algorithm, but they were. Um, early computer pioneers, um, you know, and these are stories of women that we've never heard of. Yeah. Because yeah. Uh, I I don't know whether, I don't think it's intentional. I think it's just structural. Um, you mm. know, um, the guy's got to tell the story. Um, and yeah. the women kind of got left out. Um, I mean, what you don't maybe don't know is that the original programming team for the Manchester Mark One, the Franti Mark One, which is one of the early commercial computers, mm. was almost gender balanced. It was like twelve women, thirteen men. You know, it really was almost fifty fifty. And uh, one of the programmers in there campaigned and got equal pay for the female programmers. Um. Uh, and she ended up marrying another programmer called Berners Lee. They had a son called Timothy, um, who you may have heard of because yeah. he's the guy that invented the internet. Yeah. Wow. Um, you know, but you know, not many people realize that there were loads of women in early computing, and then. In the 80s, there was a big push to get more people into computing. And actually, the number of women in, in courses went up. And it was, you know, it got to about 30, 30 to 40%, you know, 35% maybe women in computer science courses. But it's dropped down again, you know, and now it's back to the old 5 7%. And, you know, it's like... Uh, yeah, there's... You know, I, I think it's interesting reading about things like how things get gendered, you know, yes. and, and how marketing yeah. pushes, yes. you know, uh, I think some of my my uh, literature I read talked about the weird science phenomenon and the, you know, the nerdy outcast boy who, yeah. you know, has to track the code and and all, all these things. And, and so the, the mark, you know, they, they heavily market those things. And, I've, you know, of course, we've talked about family dynamics as well. Yes. Um, um, and unfortunately, yeah, that's the other thing. Yeah. Is, I call Just, it friendly fire, but unfortunately it happens. You yeah. know, actually, female peers uh, often dissuade women from going down that route, um, which really they shouldn't, um, you know. Yeah, I, uh, I, 
I, oh, yeah. I think, sorry, I was just going to jump in because I know that Sound Girls is one of those, you know, um, phenomena that <clears throat> sprung at, in reaction to that, you know, to try yes. and counter to Absolutely. try and counter that. So um, well done, Sound Girls. <laughs> mm. and, and maybe we can talk too about, um, I'm trying to figure out what would be uh, a good thing to talk about in terms of role modeling since we seem to be um, on that on that yeah, topic we, we can do um uh, just about how just about how you perceive because um i think now you are um an authority you know what i mean um you've been in the industry for a long time and you're highly visible and i think sound girls you know want you um to tell your story um because you know we want to elevate our role models so maybe yeah. you can just talk about how you feel about um your your position I've never really thought about being a role model i mean i know <laughs> you know it's so weird discovering you're a role model um uh, oh dear um you know i just been me, I think, is, um, um, you know, as an educator, uh, I I did try to, you know, improve the opportunity for the students to learn and, and all being well. Um, I guess when I was at York thinking about it, I used to have quite a few of the women used to end up doing their final year project for me. Um, and I I don't know whether that was because I I just expected them to be able to do things. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, didn't, I honestly don't know. Um, sorry, I just drove my camera out of focus there. Uh, it looks okay. That. Yeah, you're uh, totally a focus for me. So. Um. So. Yeah. I honestly don't know. I mean, we haven't talked about green amplification and things, but uh, yeah. I mean, I, I've never really seen myself as a role model, but I guess that's something you end up sneakily growing into without realizing. Um, I think so. It it's sort of like a a rite of passage almost. <clears throat> So I talked about a little bit of a rite of passage. So you get to a certain point in your career where maybe you are realizing how you can bring people along. Right. And um, for me, that happened, I think, when I, because um, I'm in my 50s now. Yeah. And I think, you know, um, when I started getting involved with Sound Girls, it occurred to me, okay, I'm an educator. I have networked my behind off, so I know tons of people, and I can help people find other people. Yeah. Okay, so that sort of rite of passage is okay. You come to a certain point point in your career, you realize you know so many people, and you have so much industry knowledge, and maybe that's when you realize you know you're giving back, and you're helping people. Yeah. Um, so maybe. You know, maybe talk about that, and of course, I think if if you want to uh, talk about, because must it, it must have happened along the time that uh, you were working on the green class D amplifier. I guess so. I mean, what a I weird know, kind of juxtaposition. But if yeah, you, I mean, run with yeah, that. The, the green amplifier thing was just, I, 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 you know, I was yeah. Everybody's talking class D, and but I also know some people were unhappy with the sound of some of them. Um, and I thought, yeah, I wonder, can you do the same thing with linear amplifiers? And of course, you know, my background was originally analog electronics, or, you know, solid state electronics, physics, um, you know, computing was what I did postgraduate, if you like. Um, so, you know, I realized that, you know, musical signals spend a lot of their time near zero. Um, and if you design things in the right way, you can actually design linear amplifiers to be a low power, but capable of high power output and low dissipation in the same way as class D amplifiers. Um, that was um, really pretty much 
it. I mean, I it's funny, I was was going to carry that on further in retirement, but I've sort of run out of time for that. Um, and uh, but at the same time, I was starting to move to producing tutorials at conventions rather than um, um, just research papers, you know, and I can remember at Berlin when you you got me and a couple of other people and we we started the diversity and inclusion part in the AES to try and encourage a broader participation. Um, you know, I was, you know, I was presenting a research idea on green amplification, but I was also doing a um uh, a tutorial on audio and video coding. And I guess my sort of transition into that has been standing up there and, you know, doing what I do best, I guess, which is educating um, and trying yeah. to put together compact chunks of information that are, I hope, full of content, um, but also, you know, reasonably fun to listen to. And again, that was one of my retirement was, you know, I through lockdown, I'd realized that doing things to video is a very different skill. Still not sure I've got that. I'm much more happy standing in front of an audience. In fact, I decided that the nearest analogy to being a lecturer is being a stand up comedian. <laughs> <laughs> right. I because, totally see uh, that. Because basically you you need to interact with your audience. And, uh, you know, a bit of heckling is actually quite good. Um, yes. And, uh, you know, and uh, generally there's a much more interactive back and forth, more so than saying a bit of drama or anything like that. And I think, you know, it's what actually makes me come alive. I know people have said this, you know, you change once I walk onto that stage and uh, start presenting. I'm a different person to what I am when you're talking to me one on one. Yeah, um, I can vouch for that. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I, uh, yes, I was sort of thinking of trying, you know, there's lots of stuff on the basics, but one of the things that really does worry me is, you know, I grew up when there were valves and tubes and audio circuitry involved valves and tubes, then went through transistors. Now it's all DSP and doors and it's mostly software. Um. And there's an awful lot of knowledge in there that's being forgotten. Um, mm. And that does worry me because, you know, it's locked up here. And unfortunately, uh, you know, you can't sort of do a backup um, uh, uh, of, of my brain at the moment. So, um, and access it. Um, and it was the filing system's a mess anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess... Um, yes, I was hoping to do more tutorials and things. Um, yes, at the moment, I'm sort of brain dumping stuff in in sense of being a uh, a role model. It's nothing, I guess I guess you don't intend to be a role model. It's just something that happens, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I think it's um so what, the reason why I think you're a role model for me is because you bring yourself to whatever presentation you're doing or whatever you're talking about, you know, um, and and it you give people permission to be themselves when you do that. Yeah. Somebody said uh, I left, leave everything on the stage when I do stuff. So it's true. And I think people want that permission you know yeah. um people know things and they want to share things they might not be sure how to do it but if you can just sort of yeah. um uh come see our insecurities um yes. and and how unsure we are too yeah you know uh, it gives people per permission not to be perfect mm. no no know? i mean uh and you know i always think you know if an engineer is hearing something and I can't measure it, that's probably telling me more about my measurement abilities than the engineer. You know, and again, they might not have um, the words, the technical words 
Um, I one of my children was premature. Uh, I remember actually in the other one, they were under the care of the same pediatrician consultant anyway. And he said, he, he remember him saying to me, I always listen to the parents said, because they've had the most time observing their children. They don't have medical language, but they know what's happening to their child. Mm. So my job is to listen to what they're saying and interpret what they're saying and relate, you know, relate it to what I know and then come back at them. And I think mm. that's that's sort of true for me with students and things as well. Or people are saying, you know, I'm not happy with this because, you know, um, okay, um, why might that be happening, you know? And yeah. um, so, yeah, um, I, I will say, um, you know, the latter half of my life, I've I've been female, but, you know, I was originally born assigned male and I'm transgender. So certainly in the 60s, I probably benefited from the fact that I was not forced into womanly roles. I mean, I remember that when I first moved to the States at age nine, I've been horrified um, at the roles expected of boys and the roles expected of girls. They were both like, really? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, you know, in a sense, I've had a privileged background. Um, uh, you know, there's pros and cons. So, yeah, the green amplification is interesting. I mean, um, and uh, I know some of the ideas are sort of being semi-used in places, um, mm -hmm. which is, you know, that's fine. Again, that's the other thing about, you know, if you're inventing and developing things, people may not take all of your ideas. No, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, um, because... Um, why should they? Uh, you know, there are lots of reasons why you don't necessarily take in the full engineering solution, even because it's too costly, too complicated at the moment, maybe later on. Um, uh, it might become easier. Um, you know, when we think about what we do now, you know, I mean, my, my, my DSP signal processing, digital processing thing, I think nominally ran at about 10 to 12 megahertz. Um, so by, by the speed metrics of today, pathetically slow, but then the early computers ran at seconds per calculation. So, you know, and, and that's the point from my point of view you know i've lived through that entire arc from relays and vacuum tubes um all the way through to little arm embedded microcontrollers that cost four dollars that you can <laughs> do things with you know but, but that's four dollars but it's got a wi-fi connection you know it'll talk to the internet and <laughs> yeah, like air completely tags, bonkers um, it is bonkers it's i mean one i just want to bring our audience along with us too and and sort of and sort of tie these ideas together because um as you were talking i, I noticed you know we're, we're sort of incorporating a lot of different subjects about being role models and about gender yeah. identity and about time and I just thought that was a, this kind of a nice way to sort of bring things together is look at how far we can go with just a little bit of time, right? Yes. So um, I, you know, for all the sound girls out there and for all the um, WMXN, all the women, uh, oh. you know, transgender and non cisgender, um, we want to bring you with us. Non-binary. Non I mean, yeah. we've we're we're so fortunate to be in a time where change can happen so quickly yes because and, it certainly wasn't like that in the 60s um, right right you know um, i mean lynn conway had to go away and come back as a completely new person 
and rebuild a career from scratch in the 60s. Um, yeah. For those that don't know who Lynn Conway is, um, she developed the VLSI techniques we all use to develop these big circuits that we use to make all this stuff happen. Um, interesting woman to read up on. Um, um, and I mean, that's the other interesting thing, which is the number of LGBT people that are involved in the technological development. Alan Turing, Sophie Wilson for the arm chip, Lynn Conway for both um, the LSI design methodology, but also for the instruction reordering techniques that our computers use these days to run faster and some of the stuff on the internet as well. You know, she was involved in all of those things. Um, uh, so, yeah, role models indeed. We're standing standing on their shoulders, aren't we? Yeah. I, um, I, um, I think that's what being a role model is all about. Yeah. And um, I just want to thank you so much, Jamie, for sharing um, your story with us. Um, there's more to come though. Uh, I want to give a preview of your DSP talk uh, at the education conference in Belgium. Is there anything okay. you want to say about that? Um, very briefly, I mean, um, I, one of the things I'd wanted to, I ended up working in the telecoms business doing speech processing because it, Getting people to talk to each other is what telecoms is about, or it was in the in the in the seventies, early eighties, um, and uh, there was a particular way of there were various limitations the network put on us for doing stuff, um, and one of my fears now is that we've got so competent at doing DSP, there's all these different frameworks that we can use for doors and things like that. Um, and when I taught the DSP course at Salford in the last few years, I did it a different way, um, which seemed to be quite successful and more importantly, got the students back into getting in touch with actually processing the samples. So they understood, you know, when I use this block to do this sort of processing. What that block is doing is I can unpack it and um, uh, understand what it's actually doing to the signal. Because I think one of the things that worries me a little bit is we're moving back further and further and further away from the actual audio. Um, mm. uh, and... Uh, you know, you'll have done it, Leslie. I did it. We cut tape. You know, there's nothing like rootling around on the floor to find that piece of tape you just cut <laughs> off uh, because you need it again. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, you know, there was very, very close to the audio. And there's nothing wrong with what we're doing now. But I think it's important we don't lose the... Um, it's not just the wonderment, but the actual abilities, knowing the detail that close can get to. And I suppose uh, my my keynote at the education conference is really trying to set out a, a, a maybe a vision, uh, because uh, you know, unfortunately, I'm sort of towards. I'm not going to have the time. You know, I had hoped to do that in a bit more detail and actually maybe produce educational material but I'm not really in that position anymore so I guess this is me brain dumping on the community saying you know hey these things are all good and they've democratized audio signal processing and that, you know I'm all for participation but just here's another bit you might not have thought of which you know I what I want to do the excitement we all had when Dave got his digital filter working and we all ran around to look at mm. him, you know, mm. such a simple thing, but it was there. It was working in real time. Yes, it only worked at 10 kilohertz. I think it was limited by the A to D converter. 
actually. I think it worked out, it had a sample rate of 10 kilohertz, something like that. So, you know, it was, it wasn't audio, um, but it was so exciting because sine wave in, sine wave out. I mean, and you could see it doing its thing. And, you know, to get that immediacy um, and to maybe be able to do it in a way that's accessible to people that were like me, that didn't have lots of economic support behind them would be good. I mean, we're, we're now at the stage where people have a computer where you can buy a microcontroller for a few dollars, you know, it's sort of becoming possible for a kid in his bedroom to build a guitar pedal with some processing you know uh -huh. you know he can do it on his raspberry pi or her raspberry pi right um and uh you know they can do things um and i you know to my mind that gets it back to the excitement that we had when we did our first tape recording or did our first bit of splicing and it actually worked or I think you know when I made my first jingle for the university radio station or or you know prepped up a tape for sound effects for the drama or stuff like that you know those are all things that we got to do that were very immediate and very real and you know to get yeah. that sort of excitement back yeah so, that's that's the I think sort that's of why we're all here. Yeah, just that that um, very almost verite kind of thing. Yeah. 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 I think <laughs> that's that's sort of why I'm here. <laughs> you know, because yeah. I want to get the stuff that's in here, in there. Yeah. Jamie, I I don't know what else to say except for thank you for spending this time yeah. with us. I feel like I want to do five more. <laughs> 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 yeah, there's a limit to how long people can listen to these things yes though. i know there is but um, um before we end our recording i uh, just want to say thank you and if there's anything do you want to end uh the conversation with uh, any special message um i i i've had a really interesting life and the aes um has been i mean i think i said there's been my my tribe um and uh you know to get to the end of it to have the experiences to met the people you know i got to meet some of my heroes i got to meet wendy carlos got to meet teal and small and found they were lovely people um it's been it's been great um and i couldn't have wished for anything more let's see your gold award jamie oh the gold award <laughs> yeah, okay uh that was amazing as well. I did cry when I received it. Um, but yeah. And, uh, Congratulations. People I mean, people on this. I mean, Shannon won a gold. I mean, it's just amazing. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, we're, we're glad that you're here. Sound Girls are glad that you're here. <laughs> AS is glad that you're here. Yeah. And we have some more work to do. So we'll see you in September. Yeah. Yes, yes, I've got some slides to get together. All right. Um, right, take care, Leslie. Thank All you. All right, thank you very much. Right. Bye. Bye.